Yo, what's popping, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Vitamin C's with me, your boy Adam Taylor. As usual, I'm joined by my homie, my compadre, my co-host in crime, Mr. Tim Shields. What's going on, Tim? Not much, man. Um, nice little lull in between games, two days off. So it's good. Get a little bit of time to breathe. Looking forward to the weekend. And, you know, yeah. I'm in a I little mean, bit of better spirits, I think, after the Blazers game. <laughs> yeah, we, we all blew off some steam in the last episode. So if we weren't feeling better now, then there's something wrong. Before we yeah. get into anything, I just want to say that if you're enjoying this show, if you're new here, then welcome. If you're a returning listener slash some viewer, then thank you for rocking with us. If you do enjoy the show, please make sure to head over to the Adam Taylor NBA page and subscribe to that page. Click like on that page. I do post play breakdowns there that you won't see if you're watching on the CLNS channels. And with that said, we are proudly partnered with CLNS Media. So if you're watching there, there will be a link in the description to find the pro- like the Adam Taylor profile. Please head on over and hit subscribe that way too. Today, we're going to be looking at Marcus Smart. I think this episode is basically the Marcus Smart episode. He had some comments with Jared Weiss during an interview that came out on Twitter yesterday. But more importantly, there's a discussion that needs to be had about whether right now Smart should be getting benched. Now, we're not saying bench him as in he doesn't play. We're not saying it's permanently benching him. But what we are saying is Derek White's playing out of his mind right now. And Marcus Smart is clearly dealing with some injuries, a little bit of loss of form. We're not seeing the, the defensive upside we saw from him last season. It seems a little bit slow on the perimeter. And the offense that we saw from him this season, like in the playmaking terms, being able to orchestrate an offense, dictate tempo, we're not really seeing that at the moment. So we're going to dive into that too. I'm going to let Tim choose where he wants to start here, whether he wants to start with the controversial we should bench smart, or whether he wants to hold that till a bit later and we'll talk about the, the comments first. Whichever way you want to go, Tim, I'll let you rock with it, man. I think we should go off the comments just because there's kind of been a little bit of buzz about this. Um if folks didn't see it, Fred Van Vliet had a pretty controversial interview where he just went in post game following, I think it was Raptors versus Clippers and the Raptors ended up losing um, and had some really, really harsh comments about Ben Taylor, who was one of the NBA officials. And yeah, he ended up ripping into the NBA officiating and he's been fined about $30,000 for it as well. Um, no other news on like a suspension or anything like that. Um, and then Marcus Smart was asked about his foul trouble. Um, this is from Jared Weiss and the officiating concerns and said, I don't know if you guys saw the uh, Fred Van Vliet thing, but that's all I'm going to say. I'm going to let Fred do all the talking, which I found to be pretty funny. But another nugget in that is him talking about his ankle. And this is the same ankle that he hurt. Um, he said he retweaked his ankle injury last night um, against the Blazers. So. This was the day after and has picked up a few other knocks in the last week. I'm feeling it, but everything is good. Um, I'm just going to be honest. I don't think everything is good. <laughs> and I think um, I, I think this ties into the conversation about, you know, potentially benching him. It's not necessarily because he is bad or anything like that. It has to do with the fact of he's not healthy, which means he's not going to play up to his potential. And I think after last season, he played so physical on defense that now I think this season, that expectation's kind of been set. And because of these injuries, like he's just not able to live up to that expectation. And I wonder how much of it was going so hard last year to get DPOI that's impacted his health and his durability this season. But what are your thoughts? Because I think right now, like there, there are some options that the Celtics should turn to. I mean, Brogdon seems to be back and healthy still getting back into the swing of things, but um, we're going to talk about Derek White a little bit too, but w- what are your thoughts on Smart right now? Yeah, I mean, I just want to start with saying that no matter how healthy Brogdon is and how much Smart needs to be rested, I don't agree with putting Brogdon in that starting five. Like you, you are, I'm very big on preserving Brogdon's health and very big on preserving his minutes, mainly because you need Brogdon to really be a difference maker in the playoffs off the bench. You've managed to go all season without plugging and playing him for long stretches at the starting spot. I don't want it to happen now in the last few weeks and then something go terribly wrong because all of a sudden there's a bigger workload put on his shoulders. Now, he came into Boston with an injury history. It was one of the reasons why the Celtics were able to get him for the price that they did. You don't then start risking that when you've done when you've navigated it so well up until this point. You don't do that with 
three weeks left of the season. You know what I mean? Or like 15 games or whatever we're at. So no, I'm, I'm just put that out there. Brogdon, for me, should stay on the bench. In terms of smart, another avenue to look at here is like, when you're injured and you're playing on that injury, not only are you not giving the injury chance to get better, you're also giving yourself a chance to aggravate that injury further, cause more damage, um, make it become something that's a chronic injury or recurring injury. That doesn't make sense to me. Now, if Smart's saying he feels like he can play on it, then fine. You know your body. I'm not about to sit here and say what you can or can't do when only you know your body, right? And you're going to have the best medical advice available. What I would say is... <clears throat> For the first few weeks now, you've re-aggravated it. You gave it a tweak. You can feel it. I don't see why you'd need to be on the starting five at that point. Obviously, there's something to be said about coming off the bench and going against backups. And then there's something to be said about being the starting guard going up against some elite perimeter guys. And I think that that's where the biggest question mark for me is. If your ankle's hurting, are you able to stick with guys with a fast first step without fouling? Can you rotate and switch quickly enough to not create a gap that guys can shoot through? Can you navigate screens? <clears throat> Excuse me, I hope my throat went hoarse and I was trying not to cough it out. But my biggest thing is like, I feel we've already seen a little bit of a drop off from Smart. His production hasn't been there. He's shooting, you know, perimeter shooting. It comes from the knees mainly. You don't want to use your chair. But again, if your base is weak, if you're feeling a twinge in your ankle every time you go into your shooting like mechanics, a weak base leads to a weak shot. And there's no like that's a concern for me. I don't want to see him trying to get down to the rim because every time you land, you risk further aggregate aggravating that injury. So for me, I'm I'm very big on hey, if you've retweaked it and you can feel it, let's just pull back a little bit, let's reduce those minutes, let's reduce that role. Let's put you against backup level guys where there's a little bit more of a talent discrepancy and we'll just let you slowly heal and then ramp you back up in time for the playoffs. I think this is the time now. If you're not chasing that first seed, if you're kind of just like, yeah, we're confident in the unit we've got. If you're not chasing that first seed, I don't think this is the time to start piling on minutes and piling on work to a guy that clearly needs a few recovery weeks. Yeah, and I think that's sort of what the Celtics were worried about when it came down to the trade deadline for like guys like Rob. And, you know, Rob having that hamstring injury, you now have to worry about his health too. And that ties into your starting five as well. So I, I think if you want to try and give Marcus Smart rest, it makes perfect sense. And I wrote about this for Celtics blog. Um, article will be dropping today uh, by the time this recording is out. But Derek White's been phenomenal and he's been starting in that starting five unit alongside some combo, either Marcus Smart or if Smart was out, he slid over to the one spot um, and had Jalen at the two. But Derek White has been so damn impactful and dependable. Um, even after getting that neck injury, I believe it was against Charlotte after colliding, I think with Marcus, uh, he ended up not even missing a game. He's played all 67 games for the Boston Celtics. Um, and he's been incredibly impactful in terms of net rating. Uh, he's been better than Jason Tatum. It's like him, Jason Tatum, and then everybody else, especially when you look at workload, Jason Tatum has played 62 games. Nobody else has played all the games for the Celtics. Like Derek White has been the definition of an Iron Man for Boston. So when you're looking at this guard rotation right now, and you know that you want to keep Malcolm Brogdon on that bench roll, Marcus Smart definitely needs some time. Now, you have to consider things because Peyton Pritchard now is dealing with some ankle soreness because he had a collision at the end of that Cavs game when he was driving to the bucket. I think Evan Mobley might have fallen on top of him um, after you know he went for that layup. So you have to think about that now when you're factoring it in. But it makes perfect sense to give Derek White those minutes. It just depends on how that impacts the rest of your rotations. And if, you know, if Pritchard's back in a game or two, then maybe that's something that you can, you know, float on by for a little bit, but you know, and I will put it out there as well. Like this road trip that they're going on, isn't the most difficult road trip in the world. In terms like the travels a bitch. There's a lot of miles that are going to be put on the clock, but in terms of like competition, if you needed to have JD Davison as your like, emergency guard rather than Pritchard. That's fine. Like Pritchard's not seeing the floor consistently. And when he is, it's not becoming impactful because he's just not in rhythm because he's not playing. 
Give that to JD Davison while Pritchard recovers and just switch to Marcus Smart, Derek White role. Or may, and then, you know, Brogdon does need to take on an extra four or five minutes a game. That's fine off the bench. And you can build out that way. I think there's enough talent in that guard rotation to, to completely navigate that. I don't think there's a concern for me in just like, hey, while well, Smart's kind of needs his minutes reduced, what the hell are they going to do? I'm like, dude, you've got a healthy Derek White a healthy again Malcolm Brogdon, and you've got a young J.D. Davison that's on a two-way deal. Like, There's enough talent there to, to limit Marcus Smart to a minutes restriction, maybe 18, 19 minutes a game off the bench, and feel completely fine about that. Now, I'm not saying, and this is kind of where I want to premise things, I'm not saying bench Marcus Smart permanently. That's not what I'm saying at all. I think he's earned the right to be the team's starting guard. However, there is also the world where Derek White is playing better right now, and you have to reward that play. If Smart returns back to full health, and then we see the Smart we saw in the early parts and midway parts of this season, where he was dictating tempo, moving the ball well, and he was just an all-round difference maker on both sides, cool, swip, swap them back. White was always bought in to be that bench guy anyway. But for right now, it just makes too much sense to put Smart back on the bench and let him recover. And then, as you said, if Pritchard's injured, like, you know, you do have a J.D. Davison. You do have some options there. I do feel like at the minute, we were, we were quite anyone that was calling for an additional wing that could handle the ruck a little bit um, at the trade deadline or after buyout market might be feeling a little bit vindicated because right now is when you could have really done with that. But, you know, we saw Wick's comments about that when he was like, yeah, it's all well and good being one of the best teams in the league, but a veteran isn't going to want to go come here for a three-month like little stint when they're barely going to get to play and it's going to affect their chances of getting a contract next season. So the Celtics, while probably a viable destination for a bunch of guys, and you know, like a destination where people are like, yeah, we could win here. It's also got the the, the negative connotations of like, yeah, we can win, but we're not going to see the floor. So they were struggling in that sense, but I do think that there's some vindication there now because right now is when they could have done with an extra body that could handle the ruck and take a little bit of pressure off this guard rotation because I already think Jalen and Jason are being overused as ball handlers anyway. Like The last thing you need is more Jalen and Jason creation. Like you need less of it, not more of it. Yeah, you've talked about that before, like having them operate off ball and have... You know, the Celtics went out and they traded for Derek White and Malcolm Brogdon, two like very capable playmakers. Like you want them to have the ball in their hands. So like Jalen and Jason can move off ball and be cutting and helping create spacing by just being there because defenses have to respect their offensive gravity. So like you have to consider that as well when you're talking about, you know, what people are good at on this roster. And like you have those playmakers, you should be using them to their full extent. And that does mean taking the ball out of Jalen and Jason's hands. But it's not like saying like they're not going to immediately get it back. It's just, hey, we're going to let this guy create for you and set you up. So you're not working so hard to create your own shot. It's not that they're incapable of doing it or creating for others. It's just it makes things a little bit easier. I mean, you saw the Warriors do that a lot with Steph Curry. I mean, look at how much he moves off the ball. And it's incredible how much he does. And Jason Tatum started to do that a lot too, in terms of like him being able to move off the ball fast and just trying to stay moving. You see it certain nights, some nights you don't. Um, against Portland in particular, like he was just chucking and he was on fire from three. Um, it was just one of those nights where he just was getting everything to go down. I think he finished like six of ten from three that night. He was looking really, really good. Um, in terms of the starting rotation, I do have some concerns too because. On top of just Marcus Smart dealing with injuries, you've got Robert Williams dealing with injuries. Yeah. And I do want to touch upon this because we've talked about him before, worrying about Grant Williams. Um, I know I had mentioned it before, and I was thinking maybe like this was tied into it, but that elbow thing that he popped up with, smooth talker, are you getting tea? <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, but Grant Williams in this elbow injury, I know that it came out, they were like, you know, the whole thing from the athletics saying like, oh, the free throws, like right, like the day after the free throws, like, oh, he's dealing with, you know, uh, some kind of tendon strain and there's muscle soreness in that shooting arm. I thought that there was something going on there for a while. I mean, he popped up randomly on an injury report in early February and then you never heard of it again outside of him saying, oh, I don't know how much I'm able to say at the time. 
So how much do you think that's really impacting him? Is it something that needs to be concerned about? And especially when you talk about adding another wing or something like that, Grant Williams is now dealing with like a pretty serious injury that's impacting his ability to help the Celtics. Like, do you try and bring up one of these guys from Maine? Like, do you look at Tony Schnell or maybe do you look at adding like Lucas Samanich? Like, is that something that you have to consider now with him dealing for injuries? Even if it's just, you know, subbing them up, upgrading somebody to a two way, so on and so forth. I mean, yeah, there's definitely a world where, you know, a Samanich could work as a floor spacer, but you're not getting the defense. Tony Snell could probably be the better option, but would he want to sign a contract and not play when at the minute he's getting minutes down in the G League? There's a few moving parts. I mean, Missoula seems very confident in moving, just swapping Williams and Hauser around and kind of giving putting Williams in Hauser's role. But, and Hauser's viable on defense. I think there was a very big question mark over that to start the season and what we've seen is uh, as a point of attack guy he's quite good he can defend in isolation can defend in space so there's that but I do think that there's a talent discrepancy like Grant is considerably more versatile defensively than what Hauser is Uh, I think that you know for now Grant should be shut down I don't think he should play at all like if you're injured and it's got to the point where your role has been significantly decreased and now you're getting minutes in garbage time, but you're still playing with an elbow injury. Why play at all? Why, why like against the Blazers, he played, what, 12 minutes? Did he play the entire of the fourth or half of the fourth or something? Uh, he played 12 minutes like on the on the button, actually. I remember because I was yeah. doing stat lines for the post-game show for CLNS. But yeah, he like, did not... He, play him? he literally didn't play. And I like how much of that is like, does that destroy his confidence? Or is that just like, hey, we know you're dealing with an injury, like in the perception of that. Cause like there's a whole conversation about like, is Joe Missoula punishing Grant Williams for struggling? Or is it just, we know he's dealing with something. And now that is public knowledge, like we have to kind of manage his workload even more now. Yeah, but just shut him down. Like if you're going to, because as you said, if you're risking. The confidence, you know, shots aren't falling because the elbow is hurting. Well, eventually that's going to get in the shooter's head. I'm slumping. You know what I'm saying? You're not really doing the same job you were on defense because you're favoring your arm and like you don't, you're trying not to take contact on that. Again, that's going to play with your confidence. Having reduced minutes and seeing yourself only playing in garbage time is going to hit you. Can't just shut him down. Let him recover. Bring him back. Give him a small spot in the rotation and then build out from there. I don't understand why he's still playing if he's playing with an injury that's obviously already seen to a huge decrease. I'm sorry, but I tried really hard not to laugh when the cat's on you. Yeah, but he's I jumped up like funny. three times. This is what this is what happens for anyone who's listening to audio. Uh, my cat Luke is very friendly and very affectionate, and he has jumped up a handful of times now while we're recording. But this is what happens when I leave the door open. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's just playing. It's not, it's yeah. not causing no problems. No, dude. absolutely not. Um, so my question is too, like, if you're not gonna, if you're gonna rest him, you rest him, and maybe this is where you start to get Mike Muscala more into the mix consistently. Um, I know that there were, I think he was dealing with some kind of tendinopathy, so tendonitis in his knee, but that was just like one game blip, and then he wasn't on the reports anymore. So, like, do you try and get him a little bit more settled in now at this point? Because yeah. you sort of he 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 doesn't provide the defense, but he provides the floor spacing that you want out of Grant, and, and he's quite kinda... mobile as well. He gets up and down the floor, yeah. significantly well. Exactly. Like, you know, yeah. I've got no concerns about his lateral movements. No yeah. vertical movements. Vert- sorry, vertical. <laughs> um, omnidirectional. <laughs> I'm so used to talking about lateral movement on defense that you know I just forget there's also a vertical axis. Um, <laughs> No, I, I'm down for that. I think that, you know, you made a move to trade for him. He was the guy you pivoted to once Jakob Pertl went to Toronto. Uh, we all knew he was going to be a backup guy, but right now what, one of your starting rotation is injured and your job is to play backup. So let's see you. I, I'm not against having Muscala in the rotation. I just want to make sure that Grant Williams is being given the best opportunity because don't forget every bad performance now is going to have an impact on his contract negotiations. And I'm all for getting paid. You know, if you can go get that paper, go get that paper. I'd like it to be with Boston. But at the moment, this recent stretch, should that become the norm again? And you struggle all through the regular season and then you struggle in the playoffs, by which point, let me just remember, remind everybody, 
Grant was a big part of the Celtics making that finals run last year. You know, if he struggles in the playoffs as well, then, the, you know, the check's not going to have as many zeros. Or what? It might, you oh, know, God. so I'm just like, I want him to play well. I want him to go get paid, man. Yeah, I want him to get paid too. I, I think the Twitter discourse around it is pretty funny because like everyone's like, he's just, you know, every single time he's playing, you know, he's losing money. And now we saw that report that he uh, apparently got offered four years, $50 million and declined it. Um, and so to a certain degree, I get that because you, you, if you truly think that you can go out there and you can get more than that, like that's not even, that's not 15 million AAV, you know, that's not annual average value of $15 million. You're looking at 40 or 60 million. If you want to get that 15 million. And there was points in time where people are saying like he could get up to $20 million, or at least that person being Grant Williams thinks that he can get up to $20 million. That ship's probably sailed unless he goes on an unreal run. And that's just not going to happen right now if he's hurt. Like in the playoffs, there's if he's healthy, he's incredibly impactful. Like you said, you know, he was a huge part of that finals run. Like he was so important to that. No, that game seven against the Bucks is going to live on. Like that's like the Kelly Olynyk Wizards game. Like that, it, it's iconic. He went out there, he did exactly what you needed him to do, and he was crushing it from three point range. If his shot's not there, and he's not able to do certain things. Like I think right now it's like he's having problems turning his wrist in his right hand. Like that's yeah, part like, that ties into it. Like what? Yeah. How can you play like that? How are you expected to play and contribute at that level? If and why are you being kind of played? Why are you being put on the floor? This is my question. Like let's yeah. start taking care of these guys. There's three weeks till the playoffs. There's or, no you know, reason couple... to rush it. Rest, no. rest them. So uh, that's my biggest thing at the moment. There's a couple of guys playing with some bumps. And there's just no reason for them to be on the floor. You no know, I get it. You want to win as many games as possible. You don't want to fall down the standings too much. But guess what? You've got teams like the Warriors that are just like, yeah, we'll, we don't care where we finish. We're gonna make. We're gonna be fine because we're Golden State. And that's a. It's such a different mentality. Like, oh, if we finish six, it doesn't matter because we're Golden State and we'll still blow teams away anyway. We're not concerned. Yet in Boston at the moment, it's. Oh, we need to finish with first seed or second seed because, you know, and I'm like, no, if you feel confident, that you, no matter what you're up against, it's like, remember MA last year when they were, when the Celtics were like, oh, if we lose this game, we finish, I think it was third, or if we win, we finish second. And MA's like, we don't, and I, who was it? And it was like, oh, if we lose this game, we have to face Brooklyn. And he's like, okay. and he's like, here's my bench unit. He's like, because we'll have to face them anyway. We're not ducking no one. That mentality is lacking right now that like from co from coaching down i'm not saying it's the players i'm saying from the coaching down there's no one talking about we're not ducking anyone because if you're not ducking anyone then start resting some of these guys let these injuries heal and be ready to go come the postseason it's the wrong time to be playing russian roulette yeah well and also like just looking at shooting numbers so like i brought up i brought up um i think february 13th was when he first showed up when grant first showed up on an injury report and through to now um, in that time frame, he's shooting 37.5% from the field. He's only had 48 shot attempts in that time. Um, I don't know how many games that is off the top of my head without pulling it up. Uh, here we go. Nine, he's played in nine games. And in those nine games, he's had 48 shot attempts. He shot 37.1% from three. 62.5% from the free throw line. Like he's shooting sub 40 from both everywhere. Like, yeah. And I mean, Marcus smarts also sub 40 for both of those as well. He's 39.2% from the field and 34.6% from the three and just under 77% from the line. Both of those guys are clearly dealing with injuries and like, they're both really, really important to a deep run. And this is where, you kind of have to stagger in these guys that you can play. Like, yeah, maybe JD Davidson does take that third spot for now. Just, just throw them in there occasionally. Generally, like they're running between Brogdon and White. And then you look at the power forward position. You added Mike Muscala, but also Blake Griffin's been serviceable. Like he's been solid, man. Like he's, he's been really solid. I'm all for the Blake Griffin vibes right now. Like I yeah. think he's been really good. As a screener, as a rebounder, um, you know, he can hit the shot. He's got in, he hits enough of them for defenses to have to respect him from deep. 
Yeah. Tell it's not dark. enough to be like a weapon, but it's enough to be like, yo, you got to stick with me. You, you can't sag off from me. And then we have seen him cut through, and there's been a few times where he's like gone for a layup, and I'm like, no, you're gliding, dude. You could jam it. You could proper jam this right now if you wanted to. And he's just choosing not to. And, you know, him converting his game to a more perimeter-based a few years back when he was with Detroit is probably the reason he's still playing right now. Because if he'd been so, continued to be a like a dunker spot guy, I don't think his knees would have carried through to this point in, the, in his career. So I get that. But I'm all for the Blake vibes. I'm all for going a little bit deeper in your rotation, especially on this road trip when you're against quote unquote lesser competition, the Utahs, the Portlands. They've got Houston as well. Um, yeah, so they've got Houston on Monday, then Minnesota on Wednesday. Friday, they're going against the Trailblazers again. That's a late game on St. Patrick's Day. That's going to be rough. Um, and then they've got a back-to-back, so they'll, they'll play Friday against Portland, and then Saturdays against the Jazz, and then they'll play the Kings on Tuesday. So, so there's only two, two games in there where I'm like, yo, there's some real talent there, and that's Minnesota and obviously Sacramento. Yeah. Um, but if you don't play, if you sit smart until that Sacramento game and you mi- reduce his minutes and you completely take Grant out of the rotation and then you come back in that sack game strong, who knows how wh- whether things start clicking or not. And that also means that you could probably move away from that double big lineup for the entire road trip, play that five out, as we spoke about in the last episode. If you follow me on Instagram, it's the same thing. It's a better form of offense. They play better. They're faster. They make better decisions. They pressure the rim more. There's more paint touches. They run for more post-entry actions, get Tatum at the post. Well, during that losing streak, we were barely ever seeing Tatum go to the high post and then look to create for himself out of there. They're just doing – they do more because they have people that can handle the extra workload. It's not a bad thing. So I, I'm all in. I'm all in on giving guys some rest. I'm all in on staying with a one big rotation where you're playing five out offense at not with the uh, what is it point five principle of decide what you're going to do pass dribble or shoot within within point five seconds. And we've seen the Suns be incredibly successful with that under Monty Williams. We saw the Celtics have incredible success with that under Ime last year. Missoula's tried to build on that, but I just feel like. They're stagnating a little bit now because guys are starting to play with injuries. And I just don't like the idea of playing Russian roulette with injuries this late in the season. It just screams problem to me. Yeah, and I've got time. a big, big issue with Missoula's minutes management as it is. Um, so this just kind of goes on top of that for me. Yeah, I think I think we talked about it on last show. But I mean, Jason and Jalen have career highs in minutes right now. How do you solve yeah. that? You stagger people's minutes. And that's the one thing I really, really liked about that Portland game. You, you Jason Tatum played like 30 done. minutes. They were done they were by done. like the fourth quarter. It was like perfect. But like, you know, if Joe, like Tibbs had, if Joe Tibbs Missoula had his way, guys wouldn't just be, guys wouldn't come off the floor. There wouldn't be a timeout to bring them off the floor. Um, yeah. Don't get me wrong. I'm a big fan of what Missoula's done offensively. I, do, I, I that's like his my offense. one complaint is the minutes and timeouts. It's the minutes and, yeah. and, and how you're managing these guys. In terms of health wise, you know, so those are my only two complaints. I, I will say this I was on a podcast with Keith Smith yesterday, and he kind of reminded me, like, hey, he's 66 games into his professional coaching career. Yeah. Like, he's still got to figure some shit out. And I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm very comfortable with that. He's still got, to, but we'd still be criticizing a rookie if he made the same mistake he made on day one in like game one in game 66. If you hadn't, remember when Pritchard always caught the ball with his foot on the sideline? Yeah, he always stepped on the side and out of bounds. In the like corners. 25 games in, Brad Stevens is like, before we do anything, he's got to learn to catch the ball in bounds. And, mm-hmm. you know, Brad Stevens was like, yo, you're making the same mistake on game 25 as what you are on game one. i got to call you out at this point. So, you know, I feel like this has been a mistake from game one to game 66. I feel like it's fair to have a have an issue with it at this point. Yeah, I mean, I think if you're going to, if there's anything that you could really hone in on that's been a, uh, a through line problem uh, throughout the season. That's that fits the mold. It's just the timeouts and the minutes. And that's something that like, you know, part of it does come to awareness as a coach to be able to read the situations. And I think, I think Missoula is definitely smart enough to know better. And he's had so many people bring it up to him at this point. So I think the big thing, like timeouts bother me less now than it, they did before, but him realizing like down the stretch against the Knicks, like I probably should have called a timeout there. Yeah, I probably should have called a timeout there. Yeah, but don't think about it in retrospect. Just do it. 
Yeah. Or, or now that you thought about it in retrospect, like, okay, like actually use timeouts in the future because you can't take them with you. It's but, like a bank account. It's not going yeah, with you once it's all much. done. Yeah. With that said, I kind of feel like I've hit on everything I wanted to hit on. Me too. I was, I was, yeah. uh, no I short episode for your Friday listening, everybody, or your mm. Friday viewing, depending on how you consume this show. As I said at the top, if you are new here, welcome. Please hit that subscribe button. If you're new here on CLNS's pages, whether it's the CLNS Media or the Celtics All Access, the channel, like the Adam Taylor NBA channel, is in the description. Please go down, hit that, and then sub from there. We come at you three times a week. It's only been twice this week, if I can recall, because yes, it was just, you know, I'm going through it with studies at the moment. I'm an older student. Um, but usually three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I'm your boy, Adam Taylor. This is my boy, Tim Shields. I don't know if I just broke my desk or not. Everybody <laughs> have a great weekend, and we'll catch you again on Monday. Cheers. Cheers.